So good afternoon to one and all present. Hope everyone has had a hearty meal and are ready to dive into the last session of the day. On behalf of Amity Institute of International Studies, I, Ali Narona, welcome you all to the plenary session of the e-conference on the theme, Global Powers Equations in Asia Pacific. I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished chair, Professor Chintamani Mahapatra. Professor Mahapatra is currently Rector, Pro-Vice Chancellor of Jawaharlal Nehru University and Professor of American Studies at the School of International Studies of JNU. Having more than 37 years of extensive experience in research and above 18 years of teaching experience, Professor Mahapatra has also been involved in track to diplomacy. He is the editor of the well-known well -known Indian Foreign Affairs Journal and was Sorry, and was recently Tagore Chair Professor at the Yunnan University of China and has been awarded a number of international fellowships such as Fulbright Fellowship, Commonwealth Fellowship and visiting fellowships to undertake research in the US, UK, Austria, Australia and many other countries. Professor Mahapatra has been a visiting faculty in several UGC run academic staff colleges, the Foreign Service Institute of the Ministry of External Affairs, National Defense College and Army War College and the College of Air Warfare. He is also a regular commentator in newspapers and on audiovisual media on international affairs. Along with Professor Chintamani, we have an illustrious panel before us. We have with us Professor Dr. Sukhwan Singh Bindra. Professor Bindra is a director of research at Amity Institute of International Studies, AIIS, and Amity Institute of Public Policy, AIPP. He was a former director of chair for Indian studies at the Department of Political Science, Johannes Judenberg University of Mainz, Germany. His immense contribution to IR literature encompasses seven books on Indo-Pak relations, Indo-Bangladesh relations, India's neighborhood, determinants and dynamics of Pakistan's foreign policy, US foreign policy, and so forth. He has lectured on a plethora of issues at universities and research institutions in both US and Germany, and is a member of many academic and professional associations. Next, we have Professor Sanjeev Kumar. Professor Kumar is a professor at the Department of Political Science, University of Delhi, since 2015, having previously been Assistant Professor of International Relations at the South Asian University, New Delhi. His interests lie in Islamic thought and international relations, the politics of Muslim identity and the current world order, Islam and the West in contemporary global affairs, democratization in South Asia, Pakistan factor in India's security and foreign policy, and the domestic debates in India on the nuclearization of subcontinental security. Professor Kumar holds a PhD entitled Attitude of Indian Political Parties Towards India-Pakistan Relations and an MPhil dissertation titled Dilemmas of Indo-Pakistan Relations, the BJP Approach. We also have with us Dr. Aslam Khan. Dr. Aslam Khan is an associate professor at the Department of Gandhian and Peace Studies, Mahatma Gandhi Central University, Bihar in India. Prior to this, he served as Professor of International Relations and Deal Faculty of uh, Social and Management Studies, York State University, Nigeria. He also served as Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science and International Studies at Bahir Dar University, Ethiopia. Dr. Khan earlier served as a Peace Fellow at University of Western Australia in Perth, Australia. He also served Aligarh Muslim University as Assistant Professor of Political Science. Dr. Khan has been actively engaged in his research pursuits concerning US and South Asia, peace and conflict, South Asian politics, African politics, and terrorism. He is also the member of editorial board of several reputed journals, including Cambridge Scholars and Springer. He also serves as a reviewer for scores of international peer-reviewed journals. Naming just a few countries, he has delivered his lectures in UK, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Nepal, and many more. Lastly, we have Dr. Malgur Zata Bonikowska with us. Dr. Bonikowska is the president at the Center for International Relations. She has a PhD in humanities and specializes in international relations with particular emphasis on the European Union and communication in public institutions. She is an EU expert, government consultant and academic fellow having graduated from the Warsaw University in Italian studies, University of Paris Sorbonne in history, in history and political sciences, and the PWST State College of Theatre in Culture History. She is the alumnus of two PhD programs in Poland and abroad. She has completed a specialization program at the School of International and Public Affairs at the Columbia University in New York through the Fulbright Scholarship. 
She is the author of more than 150 publications and a tutor of over 100 bachelor's, master's, and postgraduate theses. I welcome all our panelists here today and scholars who have joined us through Zoom and are watching us live. We're extremely glad to witness your presence today. Now, without further ado, sir, Professor Chintamani, I kindly request you to take the session forward. Thank you. Sir, you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Ms. Noroha. Uh, namaste and good afternoon to all the distinguished panelists and uh, the people who are part of this uh, webinar. Uh, let me at the outset uh, congratulate the MIT Institute of International Studies and NICE based in uh, Kathmandu for organizing this wonderful event where I can see more than 120 participants on Zoom. And as uh, Ms. Norova said, many more are watching live on YouTube. Now, uh, initially I was slightly uh, confused about the title, uh, which said Asia Pacific, because now for some people at least, Asia Pacific is history and Indo-Pacific is the new concept. However, as I was scrolling through your program, I saw one particular session, uh, which is titled Asia Pacific versus Indo-Pacific. I think that session is going to debate the very concept of Indo-Pacific, that's fine. Uh, but we have uh, about four speakers in the session. All of them are <clears throat> very distinguished, very knowledgeable um, scholars in their respective field. So uh, I will make a request to all of them. It is always good to have more debate and discussion, more questions from the students and other participants than to you know make long speeches. All of you can certainly speak for at least one hour on this topic if given a chance if it is a special lecture. But this is a kind of webinar, a panel discussion. So probably it will be good if all the speakers can float their ideas um, in about 15 minutes or so, um, two, three minutes this side, that side. And later we can have uh, some comments and questions. So you'll have enough time to respond to all the questions. It's really good that the time slot is quite adequate. It's almost two hours. And uh, so we have enough time to talk. So uh, this is one. And number two, most of the participants, and of course the speakers themselves, are aware of the theme. So we don't have to have a historical narration of what happened and how it happened and all. It is basically flagging the point about global power equations. All of us know very well that before World War II, there was certain global power equations. After World War II, a different kind of global power equations emerged. Through the Cold War, it continued, and once the Soviet disintegration took place, we saw a different kind of equations among the major powers. Then, of course, when the world uh, was talking about unipolar world order, and the Americans were basking in the glory of uh, winning the Cold War, then we had this 9-11 incident again the equations among the major past changed in a very big way. That were continued for about 20 years. Now the Americans are out of Afghanistan. This itself is creating another set of, uh, you know, environment where different parts uh, and their equations, their relationship are shifting and changing in a very big way. So uh, this is the theme of this particular session. And uh, I request all of you to stick to uh, the time. I'm basically the time timekeeper. In the end, if time permits, maybe I'll give my views on some of the issues, but uh, it is better that all of you speak first rather than I myself make a long chairperson's uh, remarks. So you know, without uh, taking any more time, uh, let me request Professor Sukhan Singh Bindra to make uh, his observations. Mm. Uh, thank you, Professor Chintamani. I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Uh, seeing you after five, uh, a long time, I met you, if you remember, at a seminar organized by Professor at uh, Srinagar, uh, Uttarakhand, in the university. Yes, yes. Anyhow, as far as this Indo Pacific region is concerned, are the issues related with this region. 
I have some issues to raise and make observations. One thing is very clear that it's a region full of complications, issues, problems, and some problems are without any solution. If we start with the, you can say, the second, post-second world war period to the present scenario, you will find different ups and downs and activities and solutions and the, the new issues emerge and continuity and change is visible. As far as this region is concerned, Keeping in mind the theoretical perspective, our theoretical issues are equal linked with the problem, our issues with the, uh, some theoretical uh, scenario. To my mind, this area is concerned with massive economic activity. When I say massive economic activity, I feel so okay, as more than 60% of the world population is in one way or the other is concerned and attached with the Indo-Pacific region. If we see that more than uh, almost 60% different cultures, different type of countries, different political system, and some of the political system, you all aware that the particular the Chinese, where all the things are centered at one place, then the United States, a democratic country, Australia, India, means that the list is so long that it's very, very difficult to pinpoint the role of any particular country. That's my one observation. Furthermore, the Chinese, like the South China Sea, they are involved, they are uh, projecting themselves as a protector, they have all the stakes in the South China Sea. And China is a major contender, and the US has always visible. Since the end of the Second World War, the Cold War era, the post Cold War era, the, uh, the always is for hegemony. If we talk of US hegemony, it will be a, you can say, a big issue to explain every aspect and to, I think, so not possible. And uh, when we take up US, when we take up China, when we take up India, Australia, and so many others involved, the trade issues, aid issues, the climate issues, then the issues related with, uh, you can say, uh, human rights, uh, industry, technology, all are clubbed together. The list is very, very long and difficult to tackle. That's the main one observation I would like to make and would like the others to uh, uh, give their views. And as the, you all are aware, in the United States, the multi-industry complex are in the private sector. And if you see the, uh, how the US foreign policy is made, how it is implemented, the national interest of the United States, and uh, uh, every, uh, if you see from uh, Second World War, uh, end of the Second World War, first was the Korean crisis, Congo crisis, uh, then Cuban Missile Crisis, then Vietnam War, then this disintegration of the Soviet Union, the present scenario, means that uh, is, um, the, uh, the situation in Afghanistan, everywhere you will find the U.S. presence. And U.S. hegemony is a major concern, is the main problem which has disturbed the world order 
in a big way. To my mind, it was the United States in the initial stages when the Soviet army intervened in Afghanistan militarily, funded Osama bin Laden and other terrorist outfits to oust the Soviet army. Just relate everything. That is why I feel so. This region, Asia Pacific region, Indo Pacific region, is so vast and complex. US and the latest trend, the US uh, uh, China rivalry, is now an open secret. No doubt, in, in an address to the uh, UN General Assembly, Joe Biden has clearly uh, made it clear that. He is not interested in another cold war. Uh, I'm not in favor of any farming, any cold, uh, any power blocks are uh, having say uh, every day. But U.S. hegemony is a factor which is going to affect in a big way in, a, in this uh, the problems and issues in the Indo-Pacific region. In the same way, I can say. <laughs> the EU, then the other actors, the uh, Western Europe, that uh, when we see their attitude towards China, EU attitude, US, uh, US have different approach towards China, they, and the Chinese have a different approach towards everybody. They have their own parameters, they have their own style of working. And they have, I am a uh, keen student of this area, South Asia. I have written extensively and um, since 1974, as far as I feel so. But still, I always feel the whole issue revolves around the national interest, foreign policy objectives, the economic issues, the trade and aid, and all you can put in one basket in the Indo-Pacific region also. No doubt, the issues may change with the passage of time. And of course, the priorities may change. It always happens because international environment keeps on changing with the passing of each hour, with the passing of each day and each moment. And the, uh, it may be more complicated. And now the Final observation, if we see what are the issues, what are the same uh, if, uh, issues emerge, problems emerge, look, the military solution, the use of army, the use of coercive methods are, are no longer even advisable, uh, uh, will register any success. It looks negotiation or giving priorities to the human issues, related with humanity will create a new environment in the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Vindra. Your presentation was so pinpointed, so pinpointed, brief but powerful. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Vindra thinks that since World War II until today and probably into the near future, as the Americans were driving many developments in the Indo-Pacific region, and they will continue to do that. And one of the challenges that can come to the order in the region and the world is actually the American hegemony. Although uh, many people are saying that the Chinese um, are aspiring for their own hegemony, and that is the real danger to the rule-based order, Professor Bindra thinks that the United States itself is posing a certain amount of challenge to maintenance of uh, the order. And second point is uh, very important, very well taken. Again, he's saying that the United States was involved in Afghanistan for 20 years. War, war, fight, fight, bomb, bomb, and all that. But now that they have withdrawn, and the new kinds of challenges are coming up, particularly, although he did not mention it, particularly what he was hinting at, was the whole globe has been infected with and troubled by the pandemic 
and the economic uh, conditions of all the countries are in a very pathetic condition. So in this kind of scenario, dialogue, negotiations are the real key issue to maintain the order. Professor Bindra, I really thank you very much for your presentation and sticking to the time. Now, let me re request now the next speaker, Professor Sanjeev Kumar. Thank uh, you. I'm being Kumar. muted. Okay. Pro Professor Sanjeev Kumar. Thank you. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you, Chair, uh, Professor Mahapatra, my co panelists. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, MIT Institute of International Studies for uh, organizing this amazing seminar at a very critical juncture at uh, where we are standing in the history of IR today, history and politics of IR. And I also thank all the organizers for having me here. So basically, as Professor Bindra has set the tone, I'll also take around 10 minutes and be as crisp as possible. Uh, basically, I'll just begin with a very weird thing, you know, like I have this mobile phone, I am wearing Apple Watch, I am talking through this Apple desktop. Now, why is this so important for, uh, you know, global power dynamics that too, especially in the Asia Pacific or what Professor Mahapatra was saying, Indo-Pacific. Of course, it's not a genus faced issue. And you know, if it is, that would be discussed in the other panel, but let us take Professor Mahapatra's point of designating this as Indo-Pacific. And uh, beginning with my weird point, uh, the intersectionality, we are in international relations, we are at a very critical uh, crossroad or intersectionality of three distinct issues, uh, geoeconomics, geostrategic uh, context, as well as geopolitics. Of course, geopolitics has been very classic and then we entered into the era of geostrategy and now we are talking about geoeconomic competition among countries and that is where my mobile phone and other things come in the shift from the emphasis on uh, uh, crude oil or energy to what we call as the rare earth and how this whole idea of rare earth is instilling a kind of geoeconomic competition and uh, of course uh, how China, India, countries like US, Australia, and especially the Quad, how they will come into the picture in terms of global power dynamics and how it will impact the whole uh, Indo-Pacific region. That is where I would like to uh, uh, focus on. Uh, you know, our Honorable Prime Minister has left for the US and there is a Quad meeting also scheduled and suddenly, you know, last four years, Quad has assumed immense significance. Now, the simultaneity of the issue is very baffling, but you know, I can play the devil's advocate. US was supposed to leave Afghanistan by 2014, but you know, like they have just left. And the moment they left, Taliban has taken over. And there is a global power vacuum, you know, like. There is a global power vacuum in terms of what, you know, America suffered, what John Mearsheimer called the tragedy of great power politics and what uh, historian Paul Kennedy said about the rise and fall of great powers. So, of course, there is no decline of American power. You know, that's a very long drawn debate just in the context of present day Afghanistan. But what has happened is the tragedy which had, has confronted in terms of what you know Afghanistan has been designated as the graveyard of empires now comes in China now that is where the complexities of our uh, present day global power politics actually begins you know when we talk about the Indo-Pacific region so if you can imagine a map or an atlas so the whole idea is the trade route and then where it's not just about trade, it's all about geostrategic issues also and geopolitics also. Now, since Central Asia, South Asia are standing at the uh, you know, intersectionality between, you know, in terms of what we call as the Indo-Pacific, where the interconnection when we 
imagine in terms of what the stakes of american power actually lies so should we write off america and should we think that china will you know take over everything now that is where the debate on the indo pacific actually comes in now interestingly americans actually approached india but india softly declined that india will not be indian soil will not be used for any military purposes for foreign military purposes so it was categorical enough so india sustained its strategic autonomy in terms of deciding uh uh what to do and what not to do in terms of so pakistan on the other hand let's not debate afghanistan too much but how it has impacted the global power dynamics that actually is interesting because as pakistan was in a way you know facilitating the training of taliban and you know imran khan being a staunch advocate of considering the taliban is as liberators the americans had to live for their own domestic compulsions also there is a financial issue also there is domestic political pressures also so all that can be reckoned with but the stakes which they have on this particular trade route and the stakes that they have on the rare earth material now that is where uh, this whole indo pacific region comes into picture so now whenever we talk in terms of china we all know china has a large rare earth uh, uh, reserve america also has but the technology to actually uh, you know process it that is where american advantage actually lies india also has considerable amount of rare earth material like lead lithium thorium and others but you know and that is where the future of global uh, energy uh, dynamics actually lies you know oil has to deplete one or the other day it cannot be renewed and the experiments in terms of solar and other kind of renewable energy has of course they have been quite successful but you know the future is of electronic cars now how does it all link to the indo pacific region because of the business of the trade route and the compulsions of the americans to look for the next 50 years of not only their military industrial complex but also their businesses so there are three key issues coming in america's exit from afghanistan china may get in in terms of the so china's interest is not to like play the policeman in afghanistan as what the americans did for 20 years and also even during the 1980s through the mujahideen but for the chinese it is afghanistan's minerals and the rare earth reserves which is important now this is where quad becomes more important for the americans because out of the three countries if you look at india japan and the united states and geopolitically i don't need to substantiate its uh, all the these uh, three countries links with the indo pacific region but what is important here is the geoeconomic part of it and the geoeconomic part of it is involving the rare earth material now china is looking in terms of its own vision in terms of uh, afghanistan's you know rich rare earth material quad on the other hand is trying to act as a collective in the last four years as i said china's power has on has been on the rise it has not been on the decline but on the other hand after vietnam iraq then afghanistan so american uh, pentagon that is a military industrial complex is in a in a way you can say to play the devil's advocate it's in a bad shape in terms of that and joe biden was very clear that you know like there is no point in sending our children on foreign soil so if that is the case theoretically speaking of course there is no time to debate that whether american imperialism 
in a way succeeded or failed that's a different debate altogether but if you look at china in spite of its issues in the south china sea in spite of you know like india declaring itself as a blue water navy and you know china has succeeded in maintaining its presence in the indian ocean and that is where the entire indo pacific region comes in shivali shrestha has joined the meeting uh, now of course the whole idea is what are the options for the americans what are the options for the indians so is quad the way ahead of course in a very substantial way if you see in terms of the geostrategic exercises that the quad has been successfully doing but the whole idea of looking at indo us strategic engagement where the interests are completely different america believes in strategic interventions in places like say afghanistan india will not believe it china believes more in terms of geoeconomic competition rather than geostrategic engagement like china would not be believing in sending its army and you know maintaining order as i said now the choice for america is if it really you know is looking for a proper you know uh, way of handling this whole uh, strategic region the indo pacific region it has to be positive in terms of strengthening quad now as i said the three countries are very rich in rare earth material and as we all know already we are having like it's not just a science fiction that electronic cars so it has transformed from science fiction to more of a concrete reality and of course artificial intelligence they all form part of you know like future development rather than the oil of iraq and iran and kuwait or you know and that is where chinese engagement in afghanistan would be very very crucial so in that sense to just to conclude in one or two minutes what i would like to say is the strengthening of quad is not only uh, crucial but the problems which india will have at least for the next say short term 3 to 4 years would be to reconcile its interest with say countries like iran or russia because the problem for india to strengthen quad is significant because of you know like act east policy and you know like india is looking at that but when we look at its other front where afghanistan has become volatile and the threats of what we call as of course that's not a very uh, you know substantial threat as we what say in the sense that you know pan islamism in terms of uniting of all the islamic uh, movements where jaish e mohammed taliban is khurasan everybody coming to, to coming together for one idea of ghazwa in of course that's a fascination but that can also transform into reality as long as they you know give up their uh, own parochial interests but of course any student of islamic movements would definitely understand that taliban may not be as interested in because they already fighting in uh, the khurasan region with is khurasan but you know in that sense but still the threat is there because india has suffered a lot for last 3 to 4 decades in terms of uh, islamic extremism so in that sense india has to be very very cautious in not only maintaining its strategic autonomy but also looking at chinese geopolitical interest still looming very large in terms of arunachal pradesh and others so the way for india is also what and of course japan has its own apprehensions with china and australia has its own issues with its neighbors so in a way the future of indo pacific would considerably depend of course i may be critic on the way in which the quad alliance would actually come in thank you thank you thank you sanjeev ji uh, that was a very comprehensive uh, 
presentation on critical issues that uh, countries in the region are going to face. And uh, you raised a few questions that will continue to be debated. How good or how bad was American imperialism? I'm sure people now and in the future will also debate how good or bad is the Chinese imperialism. Those who study theory on imperialism, whether it's Lenin's theory or so many other theories, uh, those theories never expected that a communist country like China will be the owner of hundreds of corporate uh, houses and then implement a policy which will be as bad or probably worse than the Western imperialism. Look what happened in Sri Lanka. They signed an agreement with Sri Lanka, gave capital to Sri Lanka, sent technicians, engineers, even workers to Sri Lanka, built the Humbantota port, and then lo and behold, Sri Lanka is not able to even do the debt servicing. In the process, they bulldoze them, sign an agreement. For next 99 years, uh, China will operate uh, the Humbantota port. Now, these kind of fears have spread in, into Pakistan, even to a certain part of Europe and elsewhere in South Asia. So that, that should also be uh, a point of debate in the future. Your point is so well taken that from geostrategic uh, conflict, now the geoeconomic uh, competition is going to be the signature development in the Indo-Pacific region. Professor Pindra also said the same thing, and that is to a large extent correct also. But in a, in, a, in a very nice way, you raised a question and linked up about geoeconomic competition and not geostrategic issues that are going to dominate. But when you talk about Pakistan and the Taliban, in a way, those geostrategic considerations and problems are going to impact even geoeconomics in a very big way. Now, India has handled uh, extremism and terrorism in a very big way for decades now. Taliban is raising another question uh, or the possibility of the spillover effect. But the real problem is Pakistan, as you say. It is an Islamic country. It promotes Islamic extremism in Afghanistan. It is concerned about Islamic extremism within Pakistan. It is a nuclear weapon power and it brandishes the nuclear weapon. It has an all-weather friend in China which does not mind protecting the terrorists when the discussion comes in UN Security Council, that is the danger. Pakistan, China, Taliban playing the geostrategic card, which can have an impact on geoeconomic ambitions of countries, including country, country like India, is going to uh, be creating a lot of problems in the future. So it is very comprehensive, you raise a lot of valid questions, whether the US is declining, whether China is going to take over, I'm sure, People in the audience must be thinking about it, whether China is the next superpower, America is going to disappear as a superpower, or a different kind of competition will go on. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful, comprehensive uh, presentation. Let me move on to Dr. Aslam Khan now to make his presentation. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity. Uh, First of all, I must uh, thank uh, Professor Nagalachmi, ma'am, for inviting me and Dr. Divya, of course, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak in such a learned panel. And uh, today, since the uh, theme is uh, of this panel is Global Power Equation in Asia Pacific. So I am going to take here uh, Russian uh, re-engagement in the Indo-Pacific, uh, how it is changing uh, the equilibrium in the uh, Indo-Pacific. If we talk of Russia, then uh, we see the end of the Cold War and the collapse of Soviet Union that has left indelible imprints uh, on the foreign policy objects of the majority of the nations uh, across the world. So this global event had led many countries to rethink in terms of bringing desirable changes in their particular respective foreign policies. However, the leadership of uh, 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 Russia or former Soviet Union uh, right from Boris Yeltsin to Putin to Medvedev, they performed greatly to revive the economy of the country when US become the sole superpower, then in the backdrop they were uh, trying hard to revive the economy and to, to regain the lost ground of uh, strategic influence. And uh, the situation in Indo-Pacific uh, were in two global superpowers that have already mentioned by previous scholars, uh, China and US. 
uh, along with their supporting state had already gained the ground. So uh, nevertheless, Russia's decision to support China primarily to uh, counteract India's tilts towards the US as well as Washington extended influence in the uh, Russia's vicinity had brought a new momentum in the entire Indo-Pacific geopolitical matrix, one point. So therefore, a new uh, Indo-Pacific order has been emerging through alliance forming with China and the US and accordingly Russia's re-emergence and its Indo-Pacific approach vis-a-vis US-China competition and confrontation in the is the main focus of my presentation. So Russia's uh, uh, foreign policies toward Indo-Pacific, if we are talking of the post-Cold War developments, so the mutual exchanges among Russia and regional countries of the Indo-Pacific that were established during the 17th century. However, the role of Russia along with the US and other European countries in the region became obvious only during the 19th century. So then during the Cold War period, Soviet Union foreign policy towards Indo-Pacific had been largely designated through its uh, relationship with the uh, allies in the region, uh, alignment with the China uh, during the 1950s and 1960s and the subsequent Sino-Soviet split, then uh, Stalin's death uh, in uh, 1953, etc. So the continued China-Japan hostility also provided Russia a reason to be an active player in the Indo-Pacific. So after the end of Cold War, the Russian policymakers, while realizing uh, the geostrategic uh, vitality of the region, uh, had started significant bilateral engagement with China, ASEAN, and other valued nations. So in the initial period after Soviet disintegration, Russia under the Yeltsin did not pay much attention to what Indo-Pacific, uh, given several reasons, like uh, Yeltsin regime began pro-Western and therefore had established relations with the US and the Europe while uh, dissipated relations with its close uh, uh, allies like India, North Korea, Vietnam, of course. So Russia had been enthusiastic to come closer with the emerging Indo-Pacific member states, uh, Japan, through the bilateral negotiations on the disputed, uh, this four Korean Iceland that I must mention here. So how, however, uh, Japan's inflexibility on the Korean island uh, significantly repelled Russia's move to have economic engagements with the former. So it was the year uh, in, in 90s, 1993, I must say, Russia again realized the vitality of engaging with the region through establishing a practical bond uh, with the key regional players like US, China, Japan, and India. And gradually, Russia then started imparting much priority to Indo-Pacific, with China occupying the first priority, which was revealed through uh, LCN's three visit uh, in 90s uh, uh, to, to Beijing. Subsequently, Russia also enhanced its outreach in the region through uh, visits in Japan and India at the same time. And uh, while uh, coming closer to East Asia, Russia participated in the uh, inaugural uh, meeting of ASEAN Regional Forum uh, in 1994, I think, in the Bangkok. Russia became full dialogue partner of ASEAN in 1996 and gained full membership in Indo-Pacific Economic uh, Cooperation in 1998. So, uh, Hence, after the end of Cold War, Russia's policies toward Indo-Pacific showed a fluctuated uh, uh, kind of nature. So uh, during uh, Putin's uh, first presidency, Russia had focused on Asia to make its position strategically strong. Putin had worked uh, to make Russia a great economic and political power at the global level. And both the elements of modernization and development shaped his mindset, which was obvious uh, during 1999 in his political discourse that he said, I quote here, Russia was and will remain a great power, conditioned by the inherent qualities of its geopolitical, economic, and cultural essence." Unquote. So Russia followed uh, the Indo-Pacific policy uh, 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 started by Yeltsin uh, through outlining three key goals like ensure regional uh, stability through uh, heightened participation in global security metrics. Then among the other two policy objectives were including uh, initiating security building major, uh, measures and boosting economic and uh, political uh, context with all Indo-Pacific member countries. And China continued to occupy the foremost position in Russia's foreign policy objectives toward the region. So during the eight years tenure, President Putin had continuously uh, a chain of island located like 300 kilometer northeast from Japan's main island, uh, Hokkaido, to Russian Far East Peninsula, Kamchkata. So the Kuril Island from the base uh, basis of six decades long spell between the Japan and Russia. So uh, these were the some of the events that I highlighted 
but putin again uh, the, in 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 2006 this, uh, he uh, equally followed his chinese counterparts uh, and they visited uh, each other uh, in, uh, then a landmark treaty of good never uh, neighborliness and friendly cooperation uh, based on the diplomatic economic and other strategic means was signed for 20 years between putin and chinese president so to boost the bilateralism among uh, three core indo pacific members russia played a considerable role in formulating russia india china trilateral forum japan north korea and south korea were among the few other states uh, with with whom putin sought to have an improved relationship so in uh, this regard putin paid a personal visit to japan north korea south korea and other states so these were the uh, uh, developments uh, in terms of indo pacific when we uh, consider all these things that it is clear that indo pacific has gained a vital position in russia's foreign policy objectives in the post cold war period putin while speaking at st petersburg international economic forum in, uh, forum in 2013 he has given an intention about prolonging economic cooperation with the uh, indo pacific uh, and for such purpose he focused on promoting connectivity through trans siberian railway as well as enhanced dealing with china to so the military intervention uh, by russian federation in ukraine and annexation of crimea in 2014 had agonized the west uh, thus the uh, putin felt the need of revitalizing the existing connections with the indo pacific so this was a major turning point that russia come uh, more closer to china and to russia continues its indo pacific policy with china to occupy the center place to largest foreign direct investment and expanded bilateral trade volume uh, apart from uh, apart from both the nations have been cooperating in uh, political and strategic aspect as well both the nations have uh, shared similar concerns with the intensifying the us strategic presence in entire indo pacific japan india australia along with other indo pacific members state have been collaborating with the us and the move which russia considers against its regional approach so hence russia has tied uh, strongly with china therefore both are cooperating and supporting each other at various regional and global issues that we have seen uh, uh, china in syria and uh, with reference to ukraine we have we have seen that china supported russia so these were the uh, some of the things uh, then uh, what is the geo strategic rise of russia uh, that has been mentioned now uh, russia occupied the third spot at uh, when we talking of the uh, military uh, or uh, military expenditure and all so russia occupied the third spot at the global level only lagging behind the uh, us and china are uh, in russia's policy on procurement of sophisticated uh, weapons has been mainly designed to check the heightened military approach by the us in the region so at present uh, russia uh, is stand at second place regarding military strength at the global level uh, and uh, russian naval forces have been increasing in the northwestern russia and also possess access to the territories across arctic and pacific ocean and recently uh, there has been a debate about the russia's military exercises have surpassed the nato's maneuvers in recent times russia's latest advanced military developments and manifested through large scale soviet style uh, snap exercises uh, that enhanced patrols by uh, bomber aircrafts advanced military tactics in crimea and effective use of advanced military in the joint military uh, operations in syria and both in china uh, both china and russia had strategically collaborated in indo pacific which in turn has compelled the us to align with the other active players in the region so uh, when we are talking of sino russia geo strategic interest in indo pacific so these are some convergence and these are some uh, divergence also because the china's reach to the central asian nations is directly affecting russia's uh, economic interest and uh, uh, when uh, the the first and uh, for uh, foremost objective of china in indo pacific has been to maintain harmonious and safe flourishing neighborhood since china has been an emerging global superpower and thus has been enthusiastic to have inclusive collaboration with all the indo pacific uh, member nations so uh, in the in this globalized world every country that uh, the economic development matters the most and china therefore has initiated various economic initiatives like the belt and road uh, asia infrastructure investment bank and thereby provides a golden opportunity for the regional states to be a significant part of these uh, enterprises led by the china so these were the uh, and and china has been a country in indo pacific having inclusive economic links with nearly all the regions uh, or regional countries like 
Japan, Hong Kong, South Korea, Vietnam, India, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, and other South, Southeast Asian countries, Australia, Pakistan, North Korea. So in this regard, China has been favoring extended, uh, extended regional integration to ensure the comprehensive economic well-being of the Indo-Pacific and the region being rich in mineral resources as well as the vast market potential could be a viable source for China to sustain its economic growth. So the, the South China Sea region has been uh, found to occupy abundant natural resources also. Therefore, a maritime conflict is going on among the claimant as well as the non-claimant state that we have seen like uh, conflicts between China, Japan, then Indo, uh, between uh, uh, US and Russia. So these, these things uh, that we have been witness. So now uh, when we are talking of uh, uh, India, uh, the, the, uh, the, there is one important uh, point I need to mention here that uh, previous speaker uh, talked about the China, Pakistan and uh, uh, Afghanistan kind of that. But I am um, uh, going to make mention here the Russia, China, Pakistan, uh, this, 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 triang uh, this, this triangle is emerging and a new power shift is emerging that recently uh, Russia went to extend by supporting China's refusal to the verdict by the International Tribunal vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, South China um, uh, Sea dispute. Furthermore, Sino-Russian jointly military exercises across the disputed territory of South China Sea has been a successful example of escalating bilateral relationship. And in fact, the China-Russia uh, China involvement uh, uh, of a mutual trust has resulted in a boosting inclusive bilateral relationship. On the, uh, 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 one of the major reasons of the evolving Sino-Russia bond has been a reaction against extended U.S. approach toward the Indo-Pacific. So this is the uh, other point, very important point. And uh, when we talk of uh, uh, historical uh, relationship with uh, Pakistan, that uh, during the Cold War, Pakistan still toward the West had that, that agonized Russia. Therefore, Russia was not so close to Pakistan. But in the recent events, then India uh, going uh, close to the West and uh, the, some joint military exercises uh, and some uh, other kind of the military agreements and some defense agreements. And uh, uh, these are the indicators that uh, how China, uh, Russia and Pakistan is coming closer in the uh, axis of China and Russia. So these were the one of, uh, one of the major events. So the new emerging Indo-Pacific order, now the role of major powers since I've already mentioned that geostrategically it's a wider region and it's undergoing a significant change in the form of the balance of power also. And the post-Cold War period in general and the re-emergence of Russia and its alignment with China in particular has changed the entire geopolitical landscape in the Indo-Pacific. So the geostrategic rise of China and its alliance with Russia, Pakistan and other significant, significant players in the region has worried the US and its allies uh, uh, of course, uh, India, Japan, Australia. So China's geostrategic and geoeconomic engagements with the region has attained uh, uh, such a ground from where it appears that the, uh, China has attained the status of a regional hegemon. So China's claim over the entirety of the South China Sea uh, as well as refusal to accept permanent port of arbitration verdict in 2016 recent, then have been clear indication of Beijing's uh, 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 stand. So moreover, China has also openly dared many regional countries to remain away from the South China Sea dispute. Hence, Beijing has made a resilient approach uh, then regarding economic and strategic towards the Indo-Pacific. Now, let me mention here uh, uh, India's, uh, what is the India's stand here in where India stands uh, in this Russia, China, Pakistan and uh, this uh, global power race. So apart from two major powers, China and the US, the other rising uh, Asian giant India's significant role in the emerging Indo-Pacific order uh, cannot be sidelined. So India has made its position strong on the global level, given its huge economy, uh, a, a, a vibrant market, a multi-ethnicity, enthusiastic cult uh, uh, cultural, religious diversity. India along with China has been considered as the chief architect of Asian uh, century, given Sino-India robust economic, strategic and political potential. In fact, India has been recognized as one of the fastest growing economic and military power and thus emerging as a fulcrum in the new Indo-Pacific order. Uh, from Loki's to more comprehensive act East, India has made its position strong in the region. Although time and again, India has been favoring a peaceful and lasting solution to all the regional disputes, either in South Asia or in the, uh, the Indo-Pacific, primarily uh, the uh, South China Sea disputes. 
Moreover, the recent China's exp uh, expanding maritime aspirations in the Indian Ocean region has obliged India to enhance its naval presence in the Indo-Pacific. In this regard, the trilateral Malabar joint naval exercise, including India, US, Japan, uh, has been an effective means to contain China's rising maritime tactics. So in the other words, uh, I, I will quote our uh, Sri Raja Mohan here, he said that the Indian Navy's uh, new orientation toward the East uh, enables India to be a considerable actor. So uh, considering this in the evolving Asian balance of power, so uh, concisely India's own multifaceted geostrategic interests in the Indo-Pacific and hence frame its policy in such a way that seeks to balance the weight uh, of others and to avoid them from challenging its various ambitions in the region. So by concluding that uh, from the above discourse, it has now become clear that the Indo-Pacific has been undergoing a power shift uh, through the formation of all formation of alliances, counter alliances. However, uh, it appears that the main contenders are only a, uh, a few like US, China, India, Russia, Japan, Australia, and few ASEAN countries, of course. So the remaining Indo-Pacific uh, uh, countries have been either supporting their favored nations or remain away from the emergent geopolitical metrics. So no doubt India, Japan, Australia and ASEAN possesses vital roles in the emerging power uh, balancing equations in the Indo-Pacific. However, the irony has been the most of them have been acknowledged the direct alignment, uh, alignment with, the, uh, with either power, either US or China, rather they support their different moves. So consequently, Russia's re-emergence has added a new chapter in the emerging power balancing equations in the Indo-Pacific and Russia's Cold War hostility with the US and its uh, current geostrategic expansion in the Indo-Pacific uh, 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 has compelled uh, Russia to align with Beijing. In simple words, the uh, new power equations have been pro uh, proving advantageous for maintaining regional security architecture. At the same time, the power balancing situation has been also creating repercussions for the regional countries, uh, primarily India, uh, given its vast economic, political and military potential, as well as prolonged geostrategic stakes in the region. So therefore, India has been largely in favor of multipolar regional order, which is uh, indispensable for lasting peace and prosperity, as well as to safeguard its multifaceted geostrategic interest in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you very much for providing me the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khan. That was a pretty uh, longest view and you touched upon so many issues. It's a very, very good presentation. Uh, of course, there will be many, many questions on what you, what you said. Uh, the best thing about uh, your paper, in my view, is uh, bringing in the Russian uh, dimension Normally, in this kind of uh, webinars or seminars on Indo-Pacific, many, many people that take off Russia as a major power, they don't talk about Russian influence, Russian activities, but you did a good job by talking about Russia-China collaboration and how they are trying to maintain the balance. There is a very, uh, very good input into the whole discussion on shifting power equations in the Indo-Pacific region. So we are going to now move on to our last speaker in the session, a good friend of mine from Poland, Dr. Malguraj Bonikoska, very knowledgeable in the field, a friend of India, visits India quite often, keeps uh, uh, an eagle's eye on what is going on around the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, so it, it is a pleasure for me to invite now Dr. Bonikoska to make her presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Chintamani uh, Mahapatra, for this opportunity to, to be able to speak to you. Of course, my um, perception of the Indo-Pacific uh, situation is based on what we are discussing here in Europe. <clears throat> I'm speaking to you from Poland, from Warsaw, but we are all, you know, into a very deep discussion what happens in Indo-Pacific right now. And of course, Afghanistan made us also think about the whole strategy towards the region. As you uh, know, European Union is not a country, it's a bunch of countries, 27 member states, <clears throat> and we have something um, which is called the common uh, security and foreign policy, but uh, very often it's more on paper than in reality, because it's not easy to uh, get all these 27 members together, especially when we have a principle that uh, to decide anything, you have to have unanimous unanimous uh, vote, I mean, unanimous decision. So you can imagine how difficult it is for the EU to play as an actor 
one single actor in foreign and security policy. And of course, this is how we look at the Indo-Pacific, that that's the domain, that's the theater where the major you know, security threats are now um, uh, concentrated. That's number one. Number two is that, um, of course, the operation in Afghanistan, when, by the way, the Polish troops were as well enga engaged, um, in encouraged us really to debate what is the role of the US for us, and also what is the perception of the West in the globe. So uh, we are quite um, quite convinced that um, the, the decision to withdraw from Afghanistan was a right decision, but it was taken far too late. We should have done it all together, the US and the European allies, um, just after Osama bin Laden was killed. Uh, and we just stayed there too long. And that's number one. Number two is that the operation was done in a very um, bad way, which brought the West into a crisis, a crisis of perception. Or, and the other way, we can say that the, the West lost face. Lost face in the sense that uh, everybody was looking at it as a disaster. So even if the decision was right, the way how this was handled uh, um, was bad, and this brought us into a conclusion that the West um, is in trouble, that something's going wrong with the West. <clears throat> and of course, within the European um, discussion, we also pose the same question like you discuss, what is the role and the future of the United States? So the political scientists and the, uh, uh, very much the political opinion in, the, in, in Europe is that um, this may be, th there will be two ways. The Americans still have a dominant position in the world. And it may be the signal that they want to reorganize themselves. We interpret it as a reorganization of the, of the um, as a making priorities for their foreign security policy um, because they decided uh, that they are not able to be engaged everywhere. And they are not, not only interested, but they are not physically able to handle it well. And this goes in accordance with the public opinion in the US, which actually, despite whatever we can say in Europe or in Asia, took the decision of Biden positive. The Americans were happy, the, the, the American people were happy that this takes place. Of course, the way how it was handled, uh, it's again, um, judged as a as a mistake. This that's why the Biden's um, opinion polls he dropped down in the opinion polls. The surveys show that his popularity is now um, much smaller than it was before this operation. But generally, Americans are happy about the fact that they are out. And in the same time, the calculation, the financial calculation of, <clears throat> of Biden's administration shows that it evidently was very costly. You, of course, show, um, heard about $300 million daily engaged in a direct operations in Afghanistan, which now this money can go into different uh, direction. It could be spent in-house in the U.S., which is very needed because US has a lot of things to do in house infrastructure education system healthcare system social security system all these are the biden's problems uh, forget the pandemic and but on the other side it could be spent much better in the security domain uh, when america focuses but number two point is that the generally the political scientists and also politicians mentioned Vietnam, of course, because it recalls the uh, pictures of Vietnam and Saigon and the, you know, the withdrawal of the Americans from there. And everybody knows that this was a disaster as well. And America lost the war and America lost face as well. But we remember what happened net, next, that in the 80s, the, the determination to finish with the communist regime and fight Soviet Union brought America to the victory. So 15 years, around approximately 15 years after Vietnam, America won the Cold War and Soviet Union collapsed. So this is a memory. It's not only about Saigon and helicopters leaving, but it's also a vivid memory of what America did after Vietnam. It reorganized 
um, itself and it uh, prepared a clear strategy how to fight the enemy uh, at that time. So we expect that similar factors may now uh, happen in the US. And of course, if you take into consideration this new agreement with the UK and Australia, um, um, it, 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 it just shows that that's exactly what is happening. So the Americans join forces with um, the UK and Australia in order to focus on Indo-Pacific. Of course, uh, in Europe, the, there is a huge debate uh, how it was possible to do without any European partner. So this is seen from one side <clears throat> as a step, for, step further into a very clear concentration of priorities and building, let's call it a wall against China, which was, by the way, very much claimed by the Australians, as you know, uh, as you all know. There was a famous book of Hugh White, Professor Hugh White, um, How to Defend Australia. He published it several years ago, and it was a huge debate around his, um, his book because he was claiming that Australia can't rely anymore on the United States. And then Australia should really look for nuclear weapons. But finally, after some years, Australia and the United States got back into a very strong alliance which was a clear uh, signal from the US given to Australians that they still can rely on Americans and the Brits. By the way, Europe forgets very often that the UK um, and Australia are so closely um, tied up by even the, you know, the, the, the queen. Uh, somehow in the general perception of Australia, we forget the Queen Elizabeth is still, still you know, the queen of Australia as well. So uh, we think uh, that's a step towards a very clear strategy and determination to put China the limits of its expansion and to protect Australia. From the other side, we understand that for the UK, it is a very crucial agreement because it brings the UK back into a global play, into a global scene. Because for the UK's perspective, that's the most important agreement since Brexit happened. Because during Brexit, uh, I think the UK also in a way lost face uh, because it was a very painful process and the UK was blocked for several years um, um, because of this divorce with the European Union. So for the UK, from the UK's perspective, it's a huge victory that they are in. But for the EU now, it's a huge problem because, of course, you, you may hear about a huge uh, conflict, diplomatic conflict uh, France is having with the US now. And France, as you know, is a leading uh, European economy right now, together with Germany. But also it's the only nuclear power in, in Europe. They, it's the strongest European army. So in this regard, uh, the French are livid with this, uh, with this uh, contract. And also uh, the French feel neglected as far as they roll in in the Pacific. Because the aspiration of France and also in a way Germany uh, are that Europe should be active in the Pacific. That's why we were able to elaborate a new adopted, newly adopted Indo-Pacific strategy of the European Union. Despite the fact that we are 27 member states, we wanted to be more active, we wanted to be more engaged, and uh, several countries already are engaged with their uh, navy, uh, of course, diplomatic um, uh, engagement in the region, and we have uh, on the table a very uh, important um, uh, angle of this um, engagement, which is the EU-India strategic partnership. And during the Portuguese presidency in the European Union, which happened in the, during the first year, uh, first half of this year, Portugal, which is not the most important EU country, but uh, quite influential as far as um, diplomacy is concerned, uh, stresses very, very much the role of Indian uh, European partnership in the global 
place. So the India-EU partnership now is seen as an important element to work, uh, work around. And we would like to continue. As you know, we had a summit with uh, uh, the Prime Minister Modi online um, happening. So there are many positive, uh, positive elements um, brought at the table and this partnership has chances to really enlarge. However, it has to be seen in this perspective of much larger European debate about now, the European role in Indo-Pacific while the UK and the US went alone went alone without us. So uh, we expect the relations between France and the US to be very difficult right now. Of course, it's also about the contract because the French lost a lot of money uh, because of this transaction, because the Australians canceled the contract worth 50 billion uh, euros. So that's really a big problem for France. But also France wants to uh, to convince the whole EU that the whole EU should have difficult relations with the US. And in this regard, uh, we are not much, so much willing to follow the French point of view. As you know, Poland is quite uh, happy with being a very close US ally. And also many other countries in the EU would not be so keen to follow France. First, Germany, which is much more moderate as far as its relation with the US, and it's now the, the, the leading US partner in the region. So having said that, last thing I want to mention is that um, <clears throat> uh, it will have consequences also for the region, um, this, uh, allies, this alliance. First is that the EU-Australia free trade agreement was stopped, the negotiations. Because France is pushing so much for the consequences for, you know, Australia also to pay for this decision. Uh, also because France feels offended because Australia didn't um, communicate to the French government uh, this intention to break the contract. French politicians got to know just a few days before it was announced. So uh, France uh, takes it as an offense. So the EU-Australia free trade agreement were, negotiations were stopped. Um, and also uh, France feels uh, now a lot of tensions with the UK. So it's not only towards the US, but it will have consequences towards the UK and Australia as well. The big question mark will be what will be the further <clears throat> engagement of the EU countries in Indo-Pacific. Uh, we don't know yet because we'll have several meetings now taking place to respond to this maneuver. But definitely European um, External Action Service and uh, Josep Borrell, who is our minister, let's call it Minister for Foreign Affairs of the European Union, um, now um, would like to elaborate new formats of engagement if this direct participation in such an alliance doesn't take place. Of course, Europe feels neglected by the US, but which is understandable because we all know that um, European Union doesn't have really capacities as the Union in security field. We have NATO. By the way, we call this new alliance US, UK, Australia as a new NATO or as an Indo-Pacific NATO. That's what this is called by us. But we also know that um, uh, we have to concentrate on security in our region. And in this regard, Russia is number one. And I was very, uh, you know, it was very interesting for me to hear um, the, um, uh, the explanation about the uh, Russia-China relations, because we still think, I think the West still has hopes that in the long run, this Russia-China alliance will not happen. Our position is that in short run, maybe they cooperate, but that's not really a, a love relationship. It's more like transactional as of now. And in the long run, Russia will have more reasons to fear China than the West. And it will have more reasons to stick to the West because of lack of um, techno new technologies. Uh, Russia basically is a big uh, petrol station right now. 
instead of anything else. It's not really an ideological threat to the West. And it may happen, and that's something which some European politicians really hope for, basically in Italy, in France, but also in Germany, that in the long run, Russia will be pushed more towards the West in order to build a kind of a balance towards rising China. So that's how we feel and how we see the, 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 the Russia's pers- you know, prospective um, uh, re- um, relations with the European Union in the long run. I think that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monikoska. It was actually enlightening listening to you. In such a short time, so many important points that you raised are really heartening. Just to highlight one or two, you know, before uh, this AUKUS, Australia, UK, US agreement was signed, it was the Chinese who were making a lot of noise about a Pacific pact along NATO, imagining that Kuwait is actually an Asian NATO. But uh, you said this triangular pact right now is actually the NATO, in a way, a smaller version in uh, the Indo-Pacific. Your observation that uh, Russia-China partnership, strategic partnership, is going to be extremely limited is also correct. The Russians are more concerned and worried about the Chinese than about uh, the European countries to the east. In fact, the Russian gas sale to the European countries is uh, leading to a new kind of economic energy interdependence between uh, Europe and Russia. Russia happens to be the Eurasian power, one leg in Europe and another leg in the Indo-Pacific and all. And even during, uh, uh, what should I say, just just for the benefit of the audience, you know, these things are not... uh, uh, not commonly known. During the Chinese Civil War, you know, the Americans were supporting Chiang Kai-shek against Mao Zedong. Can you believe that Americans had a deal with Stalin? If you distance yourself from, you know, from Mao, we will give you complete control over Port Arthur, over Northern Manchurian railways, which are very, very profitable, and two more ports. And Stalin recognized Chiang Kai-shek government in China. The Russians are more pragmatic than ideological even during those days. And later, when the Chinese Civil War ended, Mao did not uh, knock at uh, the door of the Russian embassy, Soviet embassy in Beijing. He sent his emissary to the American embassy uh, with a message for the president to build up ties. It was the American fault that they had already announced a containment of communism doctrine and that it was very difficult for them to accept Mao, right? So these are the pragmatism. Now that is why even when the Americans said no to China, China went very close to uh, Soviet Union and people talk about Sino-Soviet uh, alliance and all that. That was so limited. By late 1960s, the Soviets and the Chinese were fighting along the Usuri River. And then a few years later, there was a split between the two. So even now, the kind of alliance, uh, it's, it's a kind of, um, uh, you know, very short-term one. And it is, uh, it is you know, thin-skinned and it doesn't have a long duration. It will be only issue-based, right? So that was a very good point that you said. But one, another interesting point that you mentioned about how $300 million was spent by the Americans in Afghanistan for 20 years. Now they're going to use the money uh, within the USA. This is where I would like to highlight that most of the American money spent in Afghanistan never left America. It remained in America because most of the expenditure was of military nature, the salary of the soldiers and the weapon systems and the contract was given to the American companies. So the money did not actually go to Afghanistan for Afghan people, for national building and all that. Lot of them, lot of them. So that is nice. And about the AUKUS thing, another interesting point that you said, which is is correct also, 
you know, France is a resident Indo-Pacific power. They have islands, they have naval bases, and they have economic interactions. There, there are French citizens living in Indo-Pacific. And when Biden uh, and uh, Johnson and then uh, the Australian PM, they quietly, secretly conduct diplomacy in G7 when the French leader Macron was present and suddenly announced a deal, it not only dealt a very big blow to the French, American allies around the world are asked raising questions about the trustworthiness of alliances, which is uh, America late. Now with this, uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, I have a request to make all of you. Uh, now there is a chat box. A large number of people are part of, the, part of it. If you have any question, please write down in the chat box and I'll request the organizers to take a note of that and read out because all the panelists can really respond to that. And by the time you're thinking about your question, I'll just make a few broad observations about the Great Power Equation in the Indo-Pacific. Not a presentation, just bullet point some development. Number one, at this moment, Although America is an extremely important Indo-Pacific power, the trust in the United States is very less even among the allies like Japan, South Korea and others. The behavior, the political behavior, the strategic behavior of the United States is unknown at the moment. Number two, the same goes with China. The trust in China that many, many countries had, China has a lot of money, they're investing, it is a win-win for all of them. The building roads and ports and the BRI, that trust level has gone down for two reasons. Number one is the predatory economic practices of China. I gave you the example of Sri Lanka. And the number two is what China did to the Wuhan viruses and never informed the world about this for a pretty long time. And for that, all of us are suffering even now. So the trust in China is also less. So the two important powers which are apparently going to have geoeconomic competitions in the region, they don't have the trust of their friends. And they have more concerns and worries and fear and apprehensions from their respective adversaries, you know. This is the second one. Third one is, when the Indo-Pacific concept was evolving, the Russians did not recognize it, did not like it. The Chinese did not believe in it, did not like it. The Europeans, uh, you know, they were following a policy of wait and watch and there was no mention of Indo-Pacific. But slowly, slowly, Indo-Pacific has come to stay for a variety of reasons. I am sure in that particular session, people will talk about it, right? So the, in, the European Union not only has brought out a strategy report, as Dr. Bonikos pointed out, on Indo-Pacific, which is very recent, relatively, relatively very recent, you know, France and Germany have sent their naval forces to the Indo-Pacific with a clear message that we are also important powers to be reckoned with in the Indo-Pacific region. And all those navies went to Japan and many other countries in the region. France, of course, I mentioned, is the resident Indo-Pacific power. By signing the AUKUS, Australia, US, UK, that agreement, now Britain, which was which is no longer part of uh, EU, although it is part of NATO, by signing this agreement, now the British are going to play a more proactive role in the coming competitions and the attempt to limit the Chinese influence. So, <coughs> India in between and Japan, these two countries which have a lot of uh, faith in uh, Quad, Quad which was uh, announced in 2007, went into a kind of uh, dormant stage for about 10 years until it was revived in 2017. And as uh, Sanjeev Ji was pointing out, uh, it has been very active in the last four years. It was Donald Trump who revived it. Joe Biden, who criticized Donald Trump on many, many issues, accepted this. And immediately, uh, in a couple of months after he assumed office, he, he conducted uh, a virtual meeting uh, with all the leaders of the four, four, four Four member countries of Quad, and lo and behold, now all these leaders are there in Washington D.C. They are going to have a Quad in-person meeting. Slowly, 
quietly quiet is getting institutionalized and in the near future in the great power equations this relationship between the quadri this quadrilateral security initiative on the one side and china's ambition under threat on the other side and china rushing to the russians for military help and equipment uh, purchase and all that thing are going to play out everything is dynamic now nothing is certain there are many countries which are not very comfortable with this august thing not because the triangular ties is anything uh, wrong but because the way it was done dr bonir koska uh, talked about afghanistan and said withdrawal was yes it was important but the way it was done sent all kinds of wrong messages around because the spillover effect of the american withdrawal was terrible for many many people many women many children in afghanistan and the way we saw how they were trying to you know get into that aeroplane it, it was a heart rending scenario in afghanistan and then suddenly you have the bomb blast there and the americans who had already left afghanistan they had to rush back 6000 troops just to maintain stability and uh, security in the kabul airport so that is actually an indication of what the kind of things that may come in the future in the future although the taliban rejecting it isis k or isk and al qaeda are very much there in afghanistan and the pakistanis are now requesting the united nations to allow a taliban representative to make a speech mr can you believe this uh, rightly sark meeting of ministers was cancelled because pakistanis were again pushing for taliban representative being part of that sark thing so a lot of uncertainty is there both in terms of geo strategic fallout as well as geo economic competition the supply chain dependence that was on china not many countries are comfortable because of their predatory economic practices efforts are being made to have an alternative an alternative you know, development to you know to to counter the bri the belt and road initiative even some of the east european countries including poland which are very are happy about this bri now they are raising questions as well because the way the chinese follow the economic practices is truly predatory and worse than uh, the traditional imperialism and all so this is a theme where we can go on and on and on uh, but i thought i will just share a few thoughts on this but i'll be happy uh, if there are questions and i request the organizers to read out the questions and then all our uh, distinguished panelists can actually respond So, Ms. Narova, can you read out the questions? Yes, sir. Of- yes, sir. We have two individuals' questions. So, the first one is from Nitish Pandey. He is a student of AIS. His question is to the European speaker. Uh, the question is: Germany, the largest economy of European Union, still has no clear policy against the Chinese expansionism in South China Sea. Unlike France, who is coordinating with India. and see india as a reliable partner in asia to counter the illegal activities of china and south china sea how do you see the eu policy to counter chinese aggression although it seems like eu itself is not united against china's unlawful actions shall yeah. i uh, respond now yes yes please. yes ma'am thank you for this question and it seems that you really uh, observed very well that um, that's exactly what we have in 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 the european union we don't have really one single voice as far as um, china uh, europe is more and more convinced that um, in the in the ideological terms it can be a threat but in the economic terms somehow european countries especially germany which is you know in a way dependent on an export to china especially in cer- certain sectors like car uh, automobiles industry but also many others they don't want the coupling from china and actually this the coupling famous the coupling it's at the end of the day impossible because all the countries the interaction is so deep that we cannot really imagine that we will be able really to cut off all the tie ups with china so the european perception is that we have to try to build a counterbalance towards the chinese expansionism and ideological expansion as well because china is very critical it, it, it criticizes severely democratic regimes for example and promotes 
authoritarian regimes, authoritarian way of ruling. So we don't want that, of course. But in the same time, uh, we would like to find a way to be able to deal with China economically, as everybody else, I guess. And so that's the approach of Germany very much. That's why the, under the German presidency, we had uh, we concluded the uh, EU-China agreement, but in the same time, this agreement is stopped in the European Parliament. It didn't enter into force because the European public opinion, and in this case, European Parliament politicians don't want this to happen because of political problems with China and because of this ideological threat China poses to our system, right? While in France, France is also very much, you know, economically uh, involved in the relations with China, but it's more determined in the security terms to be active in Indo-Pacific more than Germany, which naturally is more, you know, limited because of the Second World War experience. So in this case, France uh, is pushing for more radical engagement in military sense. And that's why this uh, US, UK, Australia deal is seen as an offense because what, uh, France as a leading power, leading military power within the European Union wants Europe to be more engaged in Indo-Pacific and cooperates with India as Professor Mahapatra rightly said. So we don't have a clear answer, uh, but definitely we don't want uh, to break all the tie-ups with China. That's how Europe see it, sees it. That was a very, very, very candid answer, Dr. Bonikoska, but let me compliment uh, what we have said just now by making uh, one or two observations on that. You know, decoupling actually is not the right word. Decoupling is not about decoupling the economic relationship with China, which is not possible. China, uh, you know, there are more than 100 countries in the world who find China to be their number one trade partner. How can they decouple? It will really create a lot of problems. You know, the main goal was how to reduce the dependence on China as far as the supply chains are concerned. Because anything that you buy or sell is no longer manufactured in one country. It is manufactured in multiple countries. But the supply chain has been made such that it passes through China. And many countries are making a modest attempt to decouple that in the sense that not to be overly dependent on China anymore for whatever they have done in uh, the recent past. So that is, that is the main thing. But the question from the Indian perspective is uh, very important and relevant. The Indians are simply thinking, generally, in South China Sea, the Chinese government claims sovereignty over an area of the water mass, which is as large as India, saying all these waters belong to me. Then they have this, uh, you know, air identification zone. They are uh, building uh, military facilities, naval <laughs> facilities uh, in islands, which are reclaimed. Uh, that island is below water, so you cannot have a territorial water. They are putting sand there, making the island up into the water, and they are claiming this is mine. So. Even in the European interest, accepting the Chinese demand of sovereignty over such a large area, nine dash line, is not in their interest. So the Indians are actually thinking that why is it that the European Union, while continuing the economic ties with China, are not even making the complaint openly that China does not have a sovereignty claim over such a large area. There are six countries which have disputes over this. So at least in principle, the European Union should support it. That is the view. Economically, you know, the, the Trump administration, which started an economic cold war with China and imposed high tariff, then the Australians followed suit. And the Chinese came very heavily upon the Australians. Australia lost a lot, lost lot of money in selling beef and so many other things. In the process, the American companies sold the same thing to the Chinese and made a lot of money. <laughs> this is really interesting. So the innocent question is, why is the European Union not even saying in principle that Chinese claims are not as per the international law? But anyway, that is my uh, 
Yeah. Uh, can I just add to that, uh, respond to that? Because the reason is very uh, uh, simple, but complicated at the same time. Uh, we have this unanimous um, principle that EU can say something, can declare something, can even implement sanctions like we do towards Russia or Belarus regime, only when all the countries support it. Unanimous decision. In South China Sea, we don't have it because of the reason that we have also in within the EU issues concerning the maritime uh, disputes and border disputes. For example, Slovenia and Croatia until today have a dispute, both EU member states. So they just block any clear statement of the EU because they see it as this, this could influence their own internal small conflict. So that's a very you know, pragmatic um, um, reason why the EU doesn't have a very strong voice towards South China Sea. But in the same time, the EU member states individually, they are pretty clear about it. We are very clear that we stick to the international law, international maritime law, and we also acknowledge the verdict of the tribunal okay. in Hague, arbitration tribunal that the Philippines won. So we very much support that. Thank you, thank you. Next question, please. Ms. Narova, can you read out the next question? Yes, sir. So the next question is from Shishti Agarwal. She asks, what is the advantages of China and Russia? And what is the major uh, interest of China and Russia? I believe that's what she says. Uh, I think, uh, let me respond to this question, sir. Yeah, yeah, please. Yes, sir. Since uh, you are asking that, uh, what are the interests of China to have a partnership with Russia? So uh, previously, I also mentioned that China has been the second largest partner of Russia, as both have recently accelerated trade and other commercial relations. And uh, recently, uh, Sino-Russian bilateral trade volume has crossed, I think, thirty billion dollars, US uh, thirty billion dollar uh, in two thousand seventeen. So in the recent times. Sponsored Bent and Road initiatives has been open to Russia and the other countries, and it has been widely debated that later could join the said economic project given a strategic cooperation with the former. Then, the, since 2015, if you will see the period, Russia has also become the largest recipient of the foreign direct investment from China. And Russia and China also share common concern regarding the US presence uh, in resource located regions of Central Asia. And during uh, 2016, uh, SEO, China's uh, Prime Minister Li, uh, he, uh, his proposal was to have free trade area among the existing members nation of the forum was equally supported by Russian president. And to promote the Sino-Russian uh, political uh, cooperation, Russia, India, China, RIC has been uh, of vital significance. And the, the, the leaders of both nations, uh, Putin and Xi, during the meeting of uh, different forums, uh, they repeated uh, to share close cooperation on diverse policy matters. And with regard to the escalating US military and arms deployment, like uh, terminal high altitude air defense system in South Korea, both Russia and China have warned about its possible negative fallout uh, uh, in the form of an armed race in the entire Indo-Pacific. So accordingly, uh, Sino-Russian joint military deals have been on the rise uh, across the South China Sea. Then the Russian Federation has been providing full support and backing to previous moves by China. That I gave the example that Syria, uh, China supported Russia in Syria in the Crimea. Uh, in the Crimea, China supported Russia. So these were some of the event. Uh, so they, they, these are, it is an alliance for the complementary interest. So in this regard, China is backing uh, Russia, China. They are backing each other. And even in the sites, South China Sea dispute uh, by their opposing external powers mediation in the South China Sea. So it is my uh, short uh, response. I hope you are satisfied. Thank you, sir. Next question, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the next question is from uh, Sony La Frontier. He is also a student at AIIS. His question is to Dr. Bonikowska. He asks, while Germany may still lean towards American influence, the Nord Stream 2 project has just finished, giving Russia grand resource leverage over Germany, which will inevitably bend Germany's politics in the middle of the two great powers. 
Well, thank you for this question. Um, you very much follow the Polish and uh, Bo the Baltic states' uh, uh, opinion that we are very much against this gas pi pipeline. We even say that that's a kind of a new Berlin wall. It's a creating of walls in a term, symbolic walls in a terms of gas pipelines where you enlarge the Russian sphere of influence over Europe through this instrument. While in Germany, the opinion is different. It's, well, of course, Germany is also divided as far as the opinion about this, uh, um, this pipeline. Some politicians are against it. Some politicians are strongly for it. The problem is in Germany that uh, some people see it that it has started some years back, many years back, and it has to be uh, finished because of two things. Because Germany barely needs uh, gas because they have a plan, as you know, Energiewende, they want to withdraw from coal completely. And uh, slowly they also withdraw from atom energy. That was the decision taken, unlike France, for example. So in order to be able to survive, they need extra resources. And the deal with Russia gave, gives them these uh, resources. So that's the reason number one. Even if it not lasts forever, because in the same time they want to build strong capacities in wind energy, solar energy, etc. But it will take some time. Uh, and the German economy consumes enormous amounts of energy, so they their calculations are very simple. They just need it. And second thing is that of course they um, they hope that in the long run this is an instrument which can bring Russians closer to the to the European Union built uh, while building the reasons why Russia will not have the reason to be a threat because it will be a good business so instead of you know being always afraid of Russian um, expansionism we can build the business tie-ups in order to diminish the will to harm us that's the logics and the third point is that um, some uh, of the German politicians don't share the opinion of Poland and Baltic states when we say that that's a, a project which uh, avoids crossing our territories, uh, which wants to build some something upon our heads, because they say there are other four pipelines which go directly through Poland and Ukraine and Baltics. So... Uh, it's just one against the other four. So we are still in the game. So I'm just recapitulating the debate in Germany, but you are right, as I say, we consider this project as a bad thing because it destroys the solidarity within the EU member states. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Nagalaksmi, uh, I think we have to wind up the session uh, in another 10 minutes, as point yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Time management is so important. There is another set of people who are waiting to speak and uh, listen. So, uh, Noroha, I would request you to read out the questions at one go. Then we give two minutes each to the speakers. And please accommodate those uh, points. And if you have any anything to conclude, you can say that. I just stick to the time. Right. Sorry, please. Aruha, please read out all the questions. Yes. So one question we have from Sile Memo. His question is, since American allies did not trust the Trump administration due to his unpredictable decisions, especially in regards to NATO, I'm sure the election of Biden as president brought great peace of mind to American allies. Is the Biden administration now as untrust untrustworthy as the Trump administration due to the apparent submarine, submarine deal? And where will allies go now in terms of making future deals and agreements with America? Next question comes from Arnold Rosario. His question is regarding the AUKUS Pact. If I'm not wrong, it has been clearly seen that three countries also said without referring China that regional security concern has grown significantly. Now in this COVID situation, how is the AUKUS going to support other nations, whether it's a small nation or so? And also what is India's stance in this situation? Uh, one question comes from Lakshmi. Her question is, now that Taliban is in power in Afghanistan and also because the geoeconomic shift and energy security in the region was highlighted by many panelists, 
what could be the possible future of the tapi pipeline project with taliban taking the lead in proceeding with the project next we have ritoche chakrabarti his question is how important is the budding indo france relationship in aiding stability to the indo pacific region also would the sour relations between india china not hamper the same uh nitish pandey also asks as we have seen brexit are we going to see the exit of hungary out of eu because we have seen the rise of nationalism in hungary under their prime minister uh osman bordelai also asks what is the future of brics um nitish pandey also asks will the new gas nord stream pipeline decrease the importance of ukraine because there is already an existing pipeline between russia and eu which passes through ukraine and how strong how will strong eu states protect the integrity of ukraine we have a question last question from major general rajesh kundra he yes. asks russia is fulcrum to international order india is in position to iron differences what is eu's view on this right uh, ladies and gentlemen the questions are very penetrating very relevant some of the questions are in a way comments and their views so i would request all the paper presenters one after the other take 2 minutes you don't have to answer each and every question but your answer can cover all the uh, concerns and issues raised by those who have uh, asked the questions so let me request now professor bindra 2 uh, minutes each not more than that uh, professor bindra uh, yes yes uh, just just wait a minute uh -huh, the one gentleman uh, made an observation regarding joe biden and trump he compared i personally feel comparing uh, uh, two uh, presidents having different uh, political affiliation and have different view points is uh, very difficult and uh, sometimes uh, you read between the lines what he said the trump said but biden said but he going to do what he had done so the uh, one has to see everything above the line between the lines and below the lines keeping in mind their political affiliation and the circumstances under which they work as far as the observations uh, made regarding the indo pacific region particularly the uh, russian uh, russian interest the chinese uh, um, uh, peeping into the chinese design so i personally feel these are the questions these are the issues which need you can say a more elaboration uh, more serious thinking thank you so much that's all from my side thank you so much professor sanjeev kumar currently muted okay uh, turkmenistan afghanistan india pipeline well that's a challenge but you know even the taliban actually knows you know like it has its own uh, bitter taste with uh, pakistan also after 2001 you know like uh, yeah. pakistan came under american pressure and we all know that even uh, the pakistani military people also went uh, you know pakistan's double play uh, they also fought in the name of taliban and when they actually came back to cross their borders they were killed by the pakistan army themselves well, like what i want to say is in a way taliban also won knows so if you give vow to everyone uh, can we say that in the upcoming years china and us starts the cold please, war era too thomas has new window please don't write on chat till i finish otherwise my laptop will not allow me to speak sorry so uh, like pakistan uh, taliban also needs india because you know tomorrow if you know it can be a probability also because taliban also knows unlike what 1996 experience was today if taliban has to survive and get global recognition india is a major player because india is like it can pressure in terms of like india's good relations in central asia especially tajikistan turkmenistan and iran and russia so there is a different kind of combination across that border so as of now tapi pipeline in a way of course there is risk but i don't think taliban would be a major roadblock on that thank you all right uh, dr khan thank you very much sir uh, with reference to the situation in afghanistan that uh, uh, most of the strategic analysts uh, 
they are saying that taliban is gaining power by their own but it was a well calculated move by united states of america to serve their strategic goals in the region they are not out of the region they have uh, they have been out from afghanistan uh, for a strategic purpose uh, so the, they are uh, very much there in their strategic calculations uh, south asia and india as a ally in south asia us badly need india as an ally in south asia so this uh, this game uh, the, the the kind of the strategic insights are coming from the strategic analysts that india is going to be a effect in your future so i don't believe in it because india is in a such a situation that uh, uh, without uh, uh, the support of india without the confidence building measures with india uh, the current afghanistan government cannot survive and the, uh, there is a friction between the taliban these are lot of things that are happening in afghanistan and uh, uh, as professor sanjeev uh, already mentioned about uh, uh, the taliban needs uh, support of uh, regional powers or the other uh, for recognition global recognition so they need badly need india and all of the statement coming from the taliban spokes person they are not anti india they said that they need india and whatever the projects india is doing they need to continue their uh, making a kind of request to india so there is, we are nowhere uh, we are having a such kind of the threat and india is a country that can uh, 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 handle the threats opposed by any of the power but in strategic calculations india is in win win situation not as a loser and secondly uh, when we are talking of uh, this global uh, there is a shift uh, uh, whether we are talking in indo pacific because these are the interest based because in international politics we uh, all the nations are following their national interest so uh, the, uh, the 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 most of the things that were happening uh, in a uh, lot of you and i with regard to the foreign spending in afghanistan and uh, when, when we are talking of uh, this new alliance emerging between uh, us australia and uh, uh, uk so these are the well calculated move because in the european union itself there is a division and some countries uh, those are having some soft uh, approach towards uh, china and some are having soft approach towards us so these are these are the uh, regeneration of the power blocks and how these uh, states are going to shape uh, th those power blocks and how they are going to protect their image this is important thank you thank, thank, you. thank you thank you so much Dr. Bonikoska, last Very word. briefly, as far as Hungary, no, because uh, the government of Hungary doesn't uh, want the exit. However, um, we have to face, maybe we will have face uh, a lot of difficulties within the European Union as an institution to, to find a way of operate, operating between such a different governments. As far as Germany, uh, let's just watch the German elections this Sunday. I remind you it's this Sunday. It will be definitely a change as far as the politics. Maybe the, the Christian Democrats will not be even in the government, uh, or maybe they will be. We'll, it's hard to say, but a lot depends on this um, uh, coalition, the new coalition, and who will be the chancellor. Thank you. Dr. Nagalakshmi, a distinguished panelist, and all those ladies and gentlemen and dear students were part of it. One of the most wonderful webinars I Did ever you all? I ever chair. Oh, thank you. Huh? Say that. You want to say something? <laughs> what a thanks. What is that? Anyway, one of the most wonderful sessions I ever chair, and I thank uh, the MIT Institute of International Studies from my side. Uh, wonderful papers, a lot of knowledge was circulating. I'm sure all of us uh, learned a great deal from it. Now over to Dr. Professor Nagarajan. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, sir. This was a really wonderful session and very informative. And students, I'm sure uh, they've been asking so many questions and I'm sure they would like to have, the, I'm going to get a demand that I need, uh, uh, we need uh, guest lectures from all the uh, panelists. So the, that's the status. Uh, thank you so much for uh, 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 sparing your valuable time for this uh, webinar. And we will be in touch. And, uh, uh, and yes, it was really a wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Arlene, you can thank all yes. the uh, panelists individually uh, as a formal uh, thanks. Right? Yes. So I'd like to formally thank everyone who attended this session, especially I extend my thanks to the chair, Professor Chintamani, and all the panelists who joined us for an enlightening session that has enabled us as students of AIIS 
with a greater understanding on how different global powers act in the Asia Pacific. Thank you again, and we hope to see you tomorrow on Thursday, 23rd September, 9:30 a.m. for this technical session two, which is the first session of day two of Vijay Issue 2021. Thank you once again.